the ground's been prepared. The season is right. The weather is exactly what it should be. And eventually it comes down to you have to decide to do something. You can no longer sit aside and continue just the planning process. It's not a, a theory anymore. It's actually time to make it happen. It's actually time to get out onto that field and to actually sow the seed. The seed that will bring forth vegetation. The seed that will, will feed, that will nourish, will make people whole. It's the seed that is the Word of God. It's time to plant. You see, in this particular lesson, I would like for you to consider with me a study from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 14 in particular. As we look at this idea of what, what I've called the Great Supper. Now, before we begin in this idea of, of the Gospel of Luke, we need to understand that Luke himself is, is a Gentile. He is a, a great historian. He's a physician. But we understand a little bit more about Luke from Colossians chapter 4. As the Apostle Paul is listing those who are of the circumcision, those who are of, of Jewish background, who have been traveling with him, have been helping him along the way. And we'll notice there in that list of those who are of Jewish background that Luke is left out. But it's at the point in time then that he turns his attention to the Gentiles, those who are traveling with him outside of Jewish background, that we find Luke's name, the physician, mentioned. You see, Luke is an individual that would write not only the Gospel of Luke, but he would also write the book of Acts, which was the account, basically, when you consider the totality of the, the writings of Luke. He would write from the beginning of Jesus, the growing up years of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, but then he goes into the establishment of the New Testament church. The beginning phases of the spreading out of that church is observed through the missionary journeys and the, the individual preachers and teachers there within the book of Acts. You see, when Luke finishes his historical account, folks, he really has composed a, a small book in and of itself from the beginning to the, the end of the establishment of the church and how it would spread at that point in time. It's this man, Luke, who writes Luke chapter 14. And that is significant as we get into this particular lesson to understand the direction, maybe the slant, maybe the hope that this particular uh, tale of events will give to individuals not only in biblical times, but also to us today. The reality is that Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he will say that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He knew his mission and he knew his purpose. And it's that purpose that plays out in Luke chapter 14, even though sometimes people don't understand it. You see, in the very beginning of the book of Luke, the Bible says there, Luke chapter 14 rather, beginning with verse 1, it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Now, as we begin this study of this great feast, this great supper, we've got to understand this is a complete setup uh, on, the, on, on the part of the Pharisees to try to trap Jesus Christ. Jesus is invited into one of the leader of the Pharisees' house on the Sabbath. Now, you think about that in and of itself, how the, the Sabbath was special to the Jewish background, how the Pharisees were obviously interested in, in their own social status and their political leadership factors as is played out throughout the New Testament. And you've got to ask the question, why is Jesus even there in the first place? Why was he invited in the first place? Because Jesus, after all, wasn't going to do much to help this, this leader of the Pharisees' social standing. After all, they had already resolved to, to kill Jesus. Why was he there in the first place if it wasn't to set him up for a trap? You see, even in this initial reading from Luke chapter 14, we find out that there's a man there with dropsy. Dropsy was a very painful illness of the internal organs where it would cause the body to fill up with water and just cause excruciating pain. But why would this man be invited to this, this feast? And definitely, why was, he, why was he placed in the position that he was? You see... Jesus understood what was going on here. 
We have to understand Jesus, knowing all things, knows the, the dilemma that the Pharisees have tried to set for him, the trap that they've tried to set for him. And so as he goes in, he sees this man with dropsy, obviously placed where he was so Jesus would have to walk by him. It's a strategic move by the Pharisees. And Jesus responds in such a way as in verse 3 he says, Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? And they could make no reply to this. Now last I checked, folks, within the reading there of the first six verses, they never asked Jesus a question. They didn't respond to him and say, Teacher, can you please tell us if it's lawful to heal this man? But see, Jesus didn't wait for that question because Jesus knew why this man with dropsy was placed there. And Jesus cut to the matter. He cut straight to the heart. And he says, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Now obviously he's appealing to some old laws that the Pharisees would have understood and according to the old law for an individual to save a life on the Sabbath was still okay. It was okay to do so. It wasn't counted as work. It wasn't counted against that person even in their social standing. So if Jesus asked that question and the Pharisees there say, oh it's okay for you to heal on the Sabbath, all of a sudden their plan is, is, is shot. It's gone. But if they say, no, you can't heal on the Sabbath, then all of a sudden, this man with dropsy who desperately needs healed, he's in pain and their, their insensitivity, their lack of compassion will play out with the rest of the people gathered there. So truthfully, Jesus asks a loaded question, one that they cannot answer. And it's obvious by that because the Bible says they kept silence. There are two occasions within this first portion of the book of Luke chapter 14 where Jesus silenced the Pharisees and the scribes even though they never asked him a question. The first one was, "Who is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? The second one was, which one of you, if you have a son or an ox fall into a well, will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day? You see, even if an animal that was used to work with fell into that well and their life was in jeopardy, that person, that Jewish individual, could pull them out of the well even on the Sabbath. It was okay to do so. And if their son were falling into a well, the, for the Pharisee to pull their son out on the Sabbath was okay to do so. And the Pharisees knew that. That's why they kept silence. You see, this particular passage is very significant because it sets the scene for now what Jesus will say to them. And this element of they've tried to trap Jesus, this element of they're trying to trick Jesus to make him stumble, to make him fall, Jesus in perfect form does not buy into that. And he will actually have a message for them that he begins to tell beginning with verse 7 as he begins to speak to the invited guest. He says there in verse 7, he began speaking a parable to the invited guest when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. See, Jesus realized something about these individuals. He realized that they were scurrying around like a bunch of, of mice trying to reach this place of prominence, which was not uncustomary at the time of a table being set and a feast being given that there would be a place of higher honor. Typically it was near the host. Typically it was to the right side of the host or to the left side of that host. Even to this day in some countries when you walk in a room, if there's a sofa that is sitting there, only room for three people to sit, the highest place of honor is the one in the middle. Well, why would they want to rush to sit at the place of honor? Why would they want to do their best to move up? 
Well, the reason was because that's oftentimes where business was discussed and, and where individuals of high prominence were, were seated so that they could not only discuss that business, but they could also uh, help each other in their social status. I mean, a lot of this had to be to deal with the social status of the day of the time that when you were invited to sit there, it was a, a, a compliment. Well, these people are rushing around to sit there and Jesus notices their lack of humility. He notices their arrogance. And he reminds them of an Old Testament concept that was taught that when a king comes in, you don't rush to sit at the place of prominence. That you allow that king to invite you up. Therefore, it will not be a shame to you that you just assumed your place of prominence. They obviously didn't get that point until Jesus brought it to light. And whether or not they got it after he brings it to light, we're not for sure. But we did realize this, that the group of people who were gathered, that they lacked humility. They had bought into this idea that they were something special. They had bought into this idea they were something great. They had achieved a certain status. Now, it's within this same chapter in verse 12 that Jesus will turn his attention to the one who did the inviting. And it says there, beginning with verse 12, And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. You need to remember that list. The poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus need to tell this, this leader of the Pharisees this, this particular message? Why did he need to remind him that when you give a feast, not to invite your neighbors, not to invite your, your relatives? Is it really that Jesus doesn't want you to have Sunday lunch with your, your family? Is it that he doesn't want you to get together with your friends on Friday night and have a dinner? That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is cutting to the heart of the motivation of this individual when the, the reality is the only reason of many of these guests are there is so that it will increase this leader of the Pharisee's social status. And even beyond that, so that he in turn will be invited to their house when their parties are thrown. That way he's part of that inner circle. And you would say, oh, it's crazy that we would do this today. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt obligated to send someone a Christmas card? Have you ever felt obligated to do for someone else? Maybe you were having a dinner. Maybe you were having some type of gathering. And because they did for you, you feel as if it's expected for you to do to them. Sure, we can understand that today, folks. That's why we send out so many invitations. Why we send out so many cards. It's not that we don't love the people, but sometimes we feel obligated. Well, they sent us one last year, so we better send them one this year. You see, that happens with us today too. It's a repayment method in the terms of man. And this individual within this text was obviously struggling with that when it came to who he invited to the feast. But do you remember the list I told you to remember? Jesus says when you invite someone, you invite the people that can't pay you back. There's nothing within them that's going to help your social status. There's nothing within them that's going to benefit you in any way, shape, or form as far as the way that you will be viewed in society. They don't have the money to pay you back. As a matter of fact, they're poor. They're poor. They can't even afford to have a meal at their house, much less to have you come to a big party. Outside of that, not only are they poor, they're crippled. They're crippled. They're lame and they're blind. People with physical ailments. Obviously, these physical ailments would have been a hindrance to some people. The man with dropsy being there was obviously a trap. It's not as if the Pharisees were just going to invite physically challenged people to their houses on a regular basis because it didn't serve their purpose. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that very well. You say, man, Jesus is pretty harsh on these individuals. Well, you know what? Sure, he's pretty harsh on these individuals because he already understands their motivation. He already understands what's going on here at play with this gathering. You see, it's these same individuals, this same group of people, the same mentality within these Pharisees that Jesus over in Luke chapter 11 would have addressed when he listed the very long list of the woes 
that he wanted to give to them. Where in chapter 11, verse 37, the Bible says, Now when they had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him, and he went in and reclined at the table. When the Pharisee saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed his hands before the meal. Ceremonially washed before the meal. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. You foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give that which was within as charity, and then all things are clean for you. He'll go on to say, but woe to you Pharisees. But woe to you Pharisees. Verse 43, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues. Verse 44, woe to you Pharisees. For you are like concealed tombs and the people who walk over them are unaware of it. He'll say woe multiple times even to the extent that one of the lawyers who is there almost gets his feelings hurt. And it's almost as if he comes to Jesus to say, wait a minute now, when you say these things about the Pharisees, you're also insulting us, is what he said there in verse 45. He said, teacher, when you say this, you insult us too. To which Jesus then answered, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. To which Jesus answered, I should not have said woe to you Pharisees. I should not have spoken the truth because that would have hurt your feelings. Did Jesus say that? Now, those of you who have your Bibles open, you know exactly that that's not what Jesus said. As soon as the lawyer spoke up and said, you insult us too, verse 45, excuse me, 46 says, Woe to you lawyers as well, for you weigh men down with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. That's probably not the exact response that lawyer hoped to get. He didn't exactly expect Jesus to turn it on him. But see, Jesus didn't do that because he hated people. Jesus did that because it needed said. Because he understood the motivation behind this mindset of the Pharisees. Of the reality of their belief, if you kept the law, there were meritorious works that God owed you heaven. Truth be known, that's not the case. And the Pharisees hadn't got that yet. They still had not grasped that Jesus was Jesus and back in verse 11, in chapter 11, they even set out to capture Jesus and to kill him. That's why I know chapter 14 is a setup. But Jesus took this opportunity to teach a very valuable lesson. Not only did he speak to the invited guest about humility, not only did he speak to the one who had, done, who had, had invited the people, but he also then turned it on everyone, to the man in particular who spoke up and said, Blessed is the man who will eat at the, king, the, the bread in the kingdom of God. You see, you can just imagine this overzealous individual. This individual who had heard what Jesus had said and basically is amening him, saying, yes, everyone who eats the bread from the kingdom of God will be blessed. Jesus would agree with that. The problem is the individuals that will be sitting at that table in the kingdom of heaven aren't exactly the individuals that these folks are thinking about. You see, and Jesus takes an opportunity as he rolls in immediately into this parable of the Great Supper. He writes, he reads, and he says the idea is a man was giving a big dinner. And he invited many, and the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought a five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. Now, as you look at this initial invitation, it's evident that all three of these folks begin to do one thing in unison. As they have opportunity, they begin to make excuses. And these excuses couldn't even be said to be good excuses. I mean, let's, let's think about this in a logical term. Who's going to buy a tract of land without first knowing what the land is? How foolish would it be to buy that tract of land? How crazy would it be to buy uh, yokes of oxen to go out and work the land if you don't even know the oxen are healthy? 
You don't even know if they can do it. I mean, we don't even buy a car today without going out and kicking the tires. And I don't really know why we kick the tires because that doesn't tell us much about the automobile. We'll lift the hood to look under the engine, but truth be known, 95% of us don't know what we're looking at. But even we know you should at least look at it before you purchase it. Why would this guy purchase these oxen without looking at them? It's ridiculous excuses. The last individual at least tries to abuse scripture when he mentions that he's married and he cannot come. Well, in the old teaching of the Old Testament, there was a provision made that for an individual within the first year of his marriage, he would be exempt from military service. But at no point in time does it say he's exempt from a social obligation that he had already said he would come to. You see, that's what this whole parable is about because an invitation would have already gone out. That's exactly why in verse 21, the slave comes back and reported to the master and the head of the household became angry. Well, if this was just the first time these folks had been invited, why should he get angry? I mean, after all, you at times invite people over to your house, but they don't come. Does that mean you're supposed to be angry at them? No. But in this culture, in this time period, it was different. You see, there had been one invitation that had gone out already, almost a save the date concept. We don't know exact time that this feast is going to be had, but we do know it will be on this date. So we would like for you to come and we need you to respond to the fact that you're coming to this dinner. We'll let you know later what time it's going to be. Thus the second invitation when he said, hey, the feast is ready, come to it. And they all began to make excuses. The reason the, get, the, the host uh, became angry was because he had already sacrificed, or excuse me, he had already slaughtered the amount of meat that was going to be had at this feast. They didn't have the refrigerator concept that we have today in the sense that you can have leftovers next week. He literally had already done damage to his herd for the benefit of honoring the guest. And beside that, it had been cooked, the table had been set, the vegetables had been prepared, whatever beverage they were drinking has been poured, and it's all part of this individual's provisions. So for them now at this stage in the game, after the table's already been prepared, they've already told him one time they're coming, for them to say now they're not coming is literally counted as an act of war. There are some places today, even in our country, in, in our world, that they will look at this refusal, ref, refusal of a second invitation as an act of war between tribes. You think about that. If I wanted to do damage to my, my neighboring tribe, why don't I tell them 150 people are coming to a dinner? They kill enough meat for 150 extra people. And then all of a sudden I say, never mind, I'm not coming. I could do serious damage to their livestock, could I not? Thus, it is counted as an act of war even in this particular event. So when this get, the host gets angry, he's not just mad because they're not coming. He's upset and very angered because of what that statement is. So what does he tell the slave to do? He tells the slave to go out at once into the streets in the lanes of the city and bring in here, look at this list, the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said to the master, what, or slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. The second command to this slave is that he's to go into two separate locations. The first location that he was told to go into after these invited guests had refused the second invitation. He says, I want you to stay within the city walls and I want you to invite those who are the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. But it's not just within the city walls that are mentioned within this particular parable. It's not just those who are within the wall. Thus, it, the concept would be those who are uh, of this race, those who are accepted within the wall, those who are accepted in this society, those who would have been of the Jewish nature, nature in this particular occasion. But he also says, I want you to go out outside of the city. And it's outside of the city that I want you to go into the highways and the byways and not just invite them to come in. He says, I want you to compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. Compelling someone is, is more than just, oh, let me invite you to this party. Compelling someone literally is just short of you grabbing them by their arm and pulling them to the feast. 
He says, I want you to be so convincing that they want to come so that my house will be filled so that the table will have people sitting at it. But did you notice the two categories of people? Those who were within the wall and those who were outside of the wall. Both categories were not individuals that could pay this host back. Both categories offered nothing socially to them. And both categories, I guess you could say, didn't deserve to be at that table. We might in our society today equate these individuals with maybe the drug dealers, maybe the prostitutes, maybe the individuals that we could not imagine having a place at that table. But you see, the idea was the slave went out and invited them. And if they responded to the invitation, then they had a place at the table. But he just didn't invite them. He compelled them. It was more than just verbal talk. It was verbal talk with, with something behind it. You see, you and I have a task today to realize that there's a table that is set and that there are places that are there and the people that you might not think about, the individuals that might make you nervous, the individuals today that you would say, oh, they'll never obey the gospel. Those are the people that as servants of God, we've been called to go and to compel. Now, I realize that doesn't make you comfortable. Because we like dealing with people that oftentimes are like us. They make us comfortable. But if that's all we do, then I'm here to tell you, my friend, we're failing. We must understand the urgency that is out there when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must understand the urgency that is there when we look at the reality that not everyone in this world is going to realize they have a place at the table unless you go and tell them. That's why when we see ourselves within this parable, we see ourselves as the servant. And our job is to take the invitation. Our job is to take the seed. Our job is to, after having cultivated the ground, throw the seed out so that your loved one can have a place at the table. Will you invite them?